Welcome to the ninth pre-recording of the Programming Languages Virtual Meetup. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in this video we're going to be covering Chapter 2.5 from the Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, which is the last part of Chapter 2. The table of contents for this chapter is entitled Systems with Generic Operations, and there are three subsections, 2.5.1, Generic Arithmetic Operations, 2.5.2, Combining Data of Different Types, and 2.5.3, Example Symbolic Algebra. We will be spending most of our time on the first two subsections. That's where all of the exercises that we're going to be covering are from, and we will briefly cover the example uh, for the third subsection, but that will be mostly left as an exercise for the watcher. So the textbook starts out by say, stating, in the previous section we saw how to design systems in which data objects can be represented in more than one way. The key idea is to link the code that specifies the data operations to the several representations by means of generic interface procedures. Now we will see how to use this same idea not only to define operations that are generic over different representations, but also to define operations that are generic over different kinds of arguments. So the textbook then goes on to show, I believe, this figure 2.23, which we have seen many times before, but this is the most complicated version. And the key point here is that we can see our uh, complex number that we covered in last week's video, where we had multiple different representations. We had the rectangular representation and the polar representation, and we looked at different ways using uh, data-directed programming to use sort of both of these representations or, or give the consumer of the complex number uh, access to both of these representations. In this chapter, 2.5, we are now combining the complex number that we've designed with the rational number that we designed way back in chapter one with also ordinary numbers, which in the code, I believe they call them uh, scheme numbers. I, I updated the code just to call the package ordinary and the tag used is number. But here we have three different types of numbers that we are going to uh, bundle together and uh, define the generic procedures add sub mole and div that will dispatch using the same kind of data directed programming model uh, to each of the corresponding uh, add subtraction multiplication and division procedures for the corresponding uh, number types which is kind of neat it's extending what we learned in chapter 2.4 and um, using it to basically bundle all the two different uh, number implementations that we defined up until this point, and then also with sort of ordinary numbers. Uh, this is also shown in the MIT lecture uh, with the following diagram. So very similar to what's seen in the textbook. This is just on the chalkboard, once again, rational, complex with the two different representations and what they call ordinary numbers in the lecture. And this is basically what we're after. Four different procedures. Uh, add sub mole and div that are going to make use of the apply generic procedure which we saw in uh, the previous chapter 2.4 and then these are going to dispatch based on the corresponding tags and if we take a look at the apply generic procedure once again from the previous chapter 2.4 this should look familiar basically uh, type tags is just the type tag procedure mapped over the args however many of them there are and then uh, we're doing a call to our get, which is gonna look up on our hash table. Um, if we're able to find the corresponding procedures, we're gonna apply those um, by to the contents of our orgs. If not, we're just erroring out. And now we're gonna look at the three different uh, packages for ordinary numbers, complex numbers, and rational numbers. So this is all of the code for the ordinary package. Note, we're basically just wrapping uh, the scheme or racket, depending on which language you're using, plus minus uh, multiply and division procedures or operators. And we are just putting them into our hash table with the corresponding tags um, that we want. So add, obviously, for adding, sub for subtracting, so on and so forth. So this is pretty straightforward for our ordinary package. Uh, we're not going to take a look at the whole rational package because we already saw this back in chapter one, but uh, this should look familiar uh, at the top of our package. We have our selectors and then our constructors, and then the procedures follow that. 
And if we look at our complex package that we defined in the previous chapter 2.4, this is going to be the constructors and selectors as well that we just saw last week. Um, note that dot dot dot, this is obviously not the full package, but we've already seen this code and it's provided once again in chapter 2.5. Uh, fully so you can copy and paste that or if you're using dr. racket you can get access to it using the sick p package but the uh, key important parts to what has been added in chapter 2.5 is the following so similar to what we saw with the ordinary number package we have calls to the uh, put method that is going to insert with the tags the uh, corresponding procedures for the different rational and complex uh, types uh, such that we can do dispatch with our generic procedures, add, sub, mul, and div. Uh, so this is basically what wasn't there before when we looked at rational in chapter 1 and the complex number in chapter 2.4. So this brings us to our first exercise, exercise 2.78, which reads, the internal procedures in the scheme number, or you can read that ordinary number, package are essentially nothing more than calls to the primitive procedures, plus, minus, etc. It was not possible to use the primitives of the language directly because our type tag system requires that each data object have a type attached to it. In fact, however, all Lisp implement implementations do have a type system which they use internally. Primitive predicates such as symbol question mark and number question mark determine whether data objects have particular types. Modify the definitions of type tag, contents, and attach tag from section 2.42 so that our generic system takes advantage of Scheme's internal type system. That is to say, the system should work as before, except that ordinary numbers should be represented simply as scheme numbers rather than as pairs who ca whose car is the symbol scheme number or what I just used as number. So this is a pretty straightforward question. As a reminder, these were the uh, three procedures that were defined and introduced in the previous chapter. Um, so basically this looks exactly the same. The only thing that's new here is that there's an extra clause in our conditional expressions and an, uh, we're making use of a number here and we're just basically um, returning a tag based on these primitives. So if we have number uh, for the datum argument that's being passed in here, we can just return number. Otherwise, we do what the conditional expression was doing before, which is uh, the last two lines. So pretty straightforward for our first exercise. Moving on to the second exercise that we're covering, exercise 2.79, define a generic equality procedure EQU question mark that tests the equality of two numbers and install it in the generic arithmetic package. This operation should work for ordinary numbers, rational numbers, and complex numbers. So this question is basically asking us on top of the add mole, sub, and div uh, generic procedures, add an EQU question mark procedure uh, similar to those. Um, so this is what we have. We're going to see three different implementations, one for our ordinary number package, one for our rational number package, and one for a complex number package. And note that these need to, these can't be standalone outside of the packages. These need to be uh, put inside the actual packages themselves. Um, for the ordinary number, we can basically just use the equal sign, similar to how we just use the plus and the minus uh, for the arithmetic um, procedures. For rational, we can basically, we're using the flip and multiply uh, division trick because if you divide two numbers that are equal, you should get one. Um, so it's sort of making use of that. If you take the numerator of one number and the denominator of the other number and multiply those, that should equal the equivalent of the uh, corresponding numerator and denominator of the two numbers. And for complex numbers, we're just checking if the real part and the imaginary parts are equal. And once we have done this, we just have to define our generic EQU question mark procedure similar to what was done for sub, uh, add, mole, and div, and we're good to go. And there's a number of unit tests here. Um, they're pretty trivial, especially for the ordinary one. We can't really do much other than just uh, check the basic numbers, but uh, calling EQU question mark on 1, 1 returns true, on 1, 2 returns false. The rational numbers are a little bit better uh, 1 over 2 uh, is equal to 2 over 4, so the constructors are doing the reductions. Um, and you can see that 1 over 2 is not equal to 1 over 3. And then we have one last unit test for complex numbers. At this point, we move on to the second subsection of chapter 2.5, which is entitled Combining Data of Different Types. And this is uh, basically talking about 
up until this point, we are defining procedures that work uh, with uh, same typed arguments. So you can add two ordinary numbers, you can add uh, you know, two rational numbers, you can subtract two complex numbers, but what if you want to add a rational number and an ordinary number? You typically should be able to do this, but currently right now, all the code that we have uh, does not support this. So the first thing that they talk about is coercion, which is basically uh, setting up, um, you know, tags in our hash table that will deal with combinations of uh, the different types that we have. So here it's uh, putting basically this put coercion function into uh, uh, another hash table. And here we're taking a scheme number. You can read this as just number or ordinary number and complex. And it's doing the coercion that needs to be done for this pair of numbers. Um, which basically here is just adding a zero for uh, the, I believe, imaginary part of the complex number, and you're good to go. The book, however, talks about how this is not ideal because you're basically going to have a quadratic number of uh, conversion procedures uh, put into your put coercion table uh, because you need to have every single pair uh, sorted out. So this becomes rather cumbersome. Um, and there is a better way to address this, uh, which they talk about, and this is in the hierarchies of types section. So basically they introduce that in our number system where we have uh, integers at the bottom or ordinary numbers, then rationals uh, one level above, then real numbers and then complex, uh, we can basically uh, set up uh, only basically conversion or coercion uh, procedures from level to level and then anytime you have to convert or do an operation between two different types you can just keep on uh, raising is what they call it in the book uh, the lower one uh, to the next level until they're both at the same level which is a, a pretty novel idea so you go from a quadratic number of coercion functions to a linear number because you only basically need to do um, coercion procedures between uh, adjacent levels and that will get you uh, if you call this recursively all the different coercion procedures between all the different types that you have and the exercises are basically asking you to implement this so I believe this takes us to the next exercise exercise 2.83 uh, it says, suppose you are designing a generic arithmetic system for dealing with the tower of types shown that we just saw. Integer, rational, real, and complex. For each type except complex, design a procedure that raises objects of that type one level in the tower. Show how to install a generic raise operation that will work for each type except complex. And this is the solution. So we have our hash table that we are putting into it uh, with sort of a key defined by two tags, raise is the first one. This should actually read number based on the code, but I clearly did not update what I have on my GitHub. Um, so this should read number, but integer is fine, uh, rational and real. And we basically just have in lambdas here, the procedures that are uh, promoting or coercing uh, the given type to the next level. So. Uh, we from going from an ordinary number or integer to rational, uh, we basically just uh, keep x, which is your number, as the numerator, and then you put the denominator as one. Uh, for rational to real, uh, you basically just divide your numerator by your uh, denominator, and then from real uh, to complex, you're basically just adding zero for the imaginary part. And then once you have this, we do the same defined procedure that we've seen for EQU question mark and the arithmetic procedures, which uh, it just follows the same pattern. And that's it for exercise 2.83. And the last exercise that we're covering is exercise 2.84, which says using the raise operation of exercise 2.83, modify the apply generic procedure so that it coerces its arguments to have the same type by the method of successive raising as discussed in this section. You will need to devise a way to test which of two types is higher in the tower. Do this in a manner that is compatible with the rest of the system and will not lead to problems in adding new levels to the tower. Uh, so this is basically implementing what we talked about earlier of uh, promoting 
um, the lower type to the next level until you have your two types at the same level. And note that for the previous solution, we weren't actually able to write unit tests for this because until we do exercise 2.84, it's not possible to test this. So we'll be writing our unit tests once we've completed this exercise. So taking a look at the first procedure that's going to contribute to this solution is a procedure called do raise and this is what's actually going to be recursively calling the generic raise operation that we defined in 2.83 we have a couple of let statements at the top which is basically getting the type uh, from a and b by calling type tag on it and then uh, we have a conditional expression so the first clause is going to be our base case once we have the two types of our two numbers, A and B equal, we just return uh, A, which is the one that we're going to be uh, promoting. Um, so this is our base case. Then if our first clause fails, we know that the type of A and the type of B are not equal. So we want to uh, promote the type of A up one level. And we are going to uh, do this recursively. So uh, once we've promoted it once, we're making another call to do raise. Uh, passing in this promoted type. Note that we're making two calls to sort of the get function uh, because if the get function fails, we want to return false. Otherwise, we know it succeeds and then we want to make our recursive call to do raise uh, until we hit our base case where we have the type of A and the type of B uh, equal. So once we have this do raise procedure, we can then inject it or insert it into our apply generic procedure that we had previously. So it's basically the same, except now we have an if expression here checking to see if the number of arguments we have is two. Uh, we are then uh, getting A and B, which are going to be uh, the two different types. Uh, and we are then passing these to do rays. Um, so note that we're first trying uh, do rays with A and B. If this fails, uh, we're going to reverse the order, and so we expect the one where A, which has the lower type, uh, is going to pass. So if A is the quote-unquote lower type, such as an integer where B is rational or complex, uh, this will end up succeeding. But if A ends up being larger, we're never going to hit the base case, and we're going to end up failing at some point. And so we'll come to the next one, and we'll swap the order. Uh, and if we don't meet either of these two expressions, uh, or clauses will end up in the else case um, where we're going to error out with a not supported operation. And so once we've added the, uh, the do raises and the conditional expression nested inside our if expression to our apply generic procedure, uh, we're good to go. And we can just uh, set up our unit test at this point. So here you can see we are just using um, two numbers. Uh, so this should work because we don't expect it to do any recursion. It'll immediately just return. And uh, we're just testing the do raise function here. Um, and so two and three should just return two. Uh, for do raise for two, where make rational is the uh, second, or the, the second uh, type is a rational number, we expect uh, two to be raised to a rational number, which will be two over one, which passes. And then we have two different tests, very simply testing uh, promotion of integers to rational numbers with two different arithmetic procedures, add and mole. So if we're adding two to the rational number three over one, we expect to get five over one, which is just equal to five. And two times three over one, we expect to get six, which is six over one as a rational number. So uh, a, a little bit tricky, but if you're able to wrap your head around chapter 2.4 and uh, the data-directed programming, this is sort of just a, a tiny extension onto that um, to get generic procedures across all three different types, which is pretty cool. At this point, we will very briefly um, cover the high level of what's talked about in the last section of chapter 2.5, which is entitled uh, An Example Symbolic Algebra. Uh, we're not covering any exercise from this uh, subsection, but feel free to work through them. It's a pretty interesting um, example. And basically what it is, is it's talking about uh, polynomial expressions, uh, different ways to represent them, and then different ways to perform ar uh, arithmetic operations in terms of adding polynomials and multiplying polynomials. And all of the exercises are based around that. So.
probably the the neatest thing um, that I learned from reading it was that there are obviously different ways to represent uh, polynomial expressions. The first one shows a dense representation where um, every single uh, coefficient is represented even if there is a term that's sort of missing. So you can see here there's no x to the 3 and so they represent that with a 0 and all the other coefficients uh, 1, 2, 3, negative 2, and negative 5 are represented here. However, they talk about how dense representations um, can end up being pretty wasteful if you have a polynomial expression like the following. We have x to the 100, nothing from the 99th power to the third power, and so you would end up with a ton of zeros, and so typically um, you end up with these sort of a list of pairs so that you don't need to represent every single um, coefficient when there's a bunch of zeros, you can just basically indicate the power and uh, the coefficient. So 100 being the power and 1 being the coefficient. Um, and then, like I said, they go on to introduce different procedures for adding polynomials, which is broken down into adding the terms with the same power um, and then multiplying terms. And all of the exercises are based around uh, sort of enhancing these procedures and your polynomial um, arithmetic uh, packages to be able to handle more and more. So if you're interested, check this out in the book. And that brings us to the last thing that I'll be covering in this video, which is uh, some small highlights from the two different lectures, the MIT lectures and the Berkeley lectures that are associated with chapter 2.5 and also chapter 2.4 because at the time I had linked uh, lectures that didn't really sync with chapter 2.4 so in the Berkeley lectures they talked about a, a couple things that I thought was worth highlighting. Um, so the first thing is from the MIT lecture uh, and I don't think this is covered in the textbook or if at least if it was I didn't pick up on it but it talks about how basically um, the polynomials example in uh, chapter 2.5 subsection 3 um, is basically an extension to what was built up in uh, the first two subsections. So we have add, sub, mole, and div, and we have three different numbers, rational, complex, and ordinary, but polynomials, um, although they are not numbers, is basically just an extension to this model. And uh, Abelson, I believe, is is the professor, goes on to show how the polynomials gets to sort of take advantage of what we've already defined in this model by using the rational uh, complex and ordinary uh, numbers as coefficients on the terms. And he goes on to draw this basically like rec go it recursively goes on and on, um, which is pretty neat. Um, and this sort of just falls out of the way that uh, this model and these packages have been designed. Hopping over to the Berkeley lectures, so this is more associated with chapter 2.4. I believe I expressed, or maybe if I didn't express in last, last week's video, I, I definitely expressed it when it came to the uh, numeric or the symbolic differentiation example and how I said that it was rather imposing and it wasn't my favorite example to work through uh, because it required prerequisite knowledge of calculus one. Um, in the Berkeley lecture series, they actually completely, I don't think they completely abandoned the complex number example, which I wasn't a huge fan of, but they spent more time, at least, with this example, which is uh, having a square and a circle, and then the two procedures, perimeter and area. Um, and I thought this was fantastic, just because it's way more approachable. Uh, the prerequisite knowledge becomes, like, I, I don't know when they teach this in different education systems, but... Uh, for some of it, it's elementary school, and if, if it's not learned in elementary school, it's it's early high school mathematics. Um, so I, I like these examples better because, in my opinion, they're just a lot easier to wrap your head around. And if you're not familiar with Calc 1 and differentiation, uh, you're not going to get it, – it's not going to be noise. So it's a lot easier to understand the concepts when you focus on. So if you have had trouble um, keeping up with chapters 2.4 and 2.5, I recommend going and watching the Berkeley lectures, which I believe are lectures 16 and 17. Um, they're called, uh, I believe, generic operators. So you can look those up in the GitHub links. Um, and yeah, it, I just thought that the way that um, Brian Harvey, the professor, broke it down was really nice. Uh, he showed sort of the conventional way of doing this, which is just implementing everything sort of freehand, then 
the data directed model where you're dispatching and then the message passing which was also covered in 2.4 and he had nice colors sort of highlighting it in this table which is hard to see in this screenshot because the quality of the youtube videos aren't that great but uh once again just uh like i said if, you, if you're having trouble with 2.4 and 2.5 highly recommend and going and checking out the berkeley lectures and last but not least in i believe berkeley uh lecture 17 as a tangent uh brian harvey points out that typically um <laughs> regular people quote unquote refer to uh, procedures or functions with a single argument as a unary uh, function and with two arguments as a, a, a binary function or a binary operation. Um, the problem is, is that binary uh, is overloaded. We, when we hear bi binary, a lot of the times we think of ones and zeros. Um, and so uh, what he calls quote unquote groovy people, they have an alternative uh, for unary and binary. And those two uh, words are monadic and dyadic. And then Brian Harvey goes on to state that monadic and dyadic, uh, these names were proposed by Ken Iverson, who invented the important but obscure programming language, APL. Woot woot. So if you've been watching up till now, you know I'm a big APL fan. And anytime APL gets mentioned, I get uh, pretty excited. So now in both the MIT and the Berkeley uh, lectures that go along with these sick P textbook uh, both professors have mentioned uh, APL, which I think is fantastic. And this uh, quote uh, is finished off by uh, saying they are great names and they don't have any other confusing meanings, which I find interesting because monadic uh, definitely has another meaning when it comes to category theory. Um, but I guess Brian Harvey is not including category theory in his statement. But anyways, just thought it was neat that he took time to go on a tangent to uh, make a shout out to APL. And yes, that's what they call their unary and binary uh, functions in APL. They call them monadic and dyadic uh, operators. That is it for this week. As always, I hope you enjoyed and I hope you learned something. Uh, this is the last part of chapter two. So starting next Monday, we will be starting on chapter three. Uh, hope you have a good night and hope to see you then.